Paul Donovan uh, joins us. He's from UBS, and he's here to explain why. Now, Paul, it, it's very interesting, actually, that you expect in the first six months, right, of, of 2012, mm. the Eurozone to go into recession, but not the U.S. Yeah. A recession, does that actually mean that we're going to see a Greek default, or is it even if the Eurozone sticks together, you expect a recession? No, so we're assuming that, well, obviously that the Eurozone sticks together. The alternative really is, is too hideous to Just contemplate. We're also assuming that you know, something is worked out with the, with the Greek deal, that we don't get additional financial disruption. But the difference between the Eurozone and the United States comes out of the financial system problems, that essentially the two economies are not that dissimilar apart from bank lending. That's the critical difference. In America, in fact, in the Anglo-Saxon economies generally, bank lending is, is positive, not strong, but positive. In the Eurozone, we've got a problem. Banks are not going to be lending. And to which point? I mean, they're not going to be lending to a point where actually we're going to see a complete credit freeze and we're seeing back to 2008 at this point? Are we actually risking a Lehman Brothers? We're no, we're not at 2008. We've got to be clear about this. And, you know, economists don't like the word recession. It's a media term, not an economic term. Um, we're not actually forecasting a devastating slowdown in the first half of next year. We're, we're just barely going negative in terms of the two quarters growth. But uh, what we are seeing is banks, particularly in France and Italy, um, being unwilling to lend. Now, France and Italy have seen a lot of credit growth this year. It's helped with their economy. France has had 6% credit growth consistently. We lose that. We lose the overall economic momentum. Paul, your growth forecast were before we heard from the Greek Prime Minister mm. that he wants to put this to a referendum. Now, A, it took everyone aback. I mean, mm. the Germans weren't expecting this. We weren't mm. expecting this. Why is he doing it? And is there a risk that actually he'll lose that vote? And if he loses that vote, mm. what does it mean for forecasts? Are we really going to see this time a, a recession, but a deep recession? Well, I think the, the reason for doing this, politically, this makes absolute sense. That, you know, he's going uh, to direct democracy away from representative democracy saying, look, okay, uh, we've got to do this, it's going to be very painful. The voters say yes, then that's fine. Every time they complain, I just turn around and say, well, look, you made the choice. Um, if the voters say no, politically, I mean, it does depend on the question, but if the voters say no, it gives him some bargaining power in Europe. And frankly, he's got zero to start off with. That, that I think, is going to be key. But, but critically, and this is what I'm trying to really understand, is that we don't exactly know. We understand that the first vote will be around the 3rd and 4th of November, end of mm. the week. We don't know when the referendum is. In mm. that time, Greece could run out of money, and so would, would directly go into a technical default mm. before it starts bargaining with the European Union. I don't think, with, with the, the EU money and the IMF money having been agreed, separate from the deal, don't forget, you're the for next the tranche of... For the first bailout, yeah. The, yeah. for the first bailout. So the next tranche of money comes through. I think Greece can probably survive into January. Now, if we have the referendum in early January, that perhaps gives two, two weeks. weeks. Absolutely. It's cutting but it fine, isn't it? It is cutting it fine. But then, you know, brinkmanship, this is what Europe is all about. We, we have this time and time again. We'll have another emergency summit. We're getting quite used to them by now. Uh, yes, we are. But, OK, so let's say that he actually goes back and says, well, you know, my voters won't mm. take this. What is Germany going to do? Well, then Germany is faced with a choice. Uh, do they allow a default, a full D scale default with all that that implies, or do they come up with another deal? And that basically is going to be the choice. But I mean, in one sense, this is attacking the, the democratic deficit that is at the heart of the Eurozone. You know, nobody's ever actually asked the people what they want as we've gone through this process. This is the first time that that's been tackled. Yeah. So to that extent, it's a, it, it could be seen as a positive development. Yeah, some say for, maybe sometimes best not to ask the people, although mm. it's not very democratic. Now, Paul, you aren't quite so downbeat about the U.S. because you're actually forecasting a gradual recovery into the American economy with growth of 2.3% in 2012, 2.7% in 2013, and that's led mm. UBS to cut its forecast for the euro. So growth in the U.S. Mm. versus the eurozone will actually lead to a depreciation with the rate against the dollar weakening to 1.25 by the end of next year. This, again, this can all change, I mm. guess, if, if Greece comes into the mix. MF Global, why are you so confident that the U.S. won't go into recession. I mean, they have mm. the banking problems, they have the credit squeeze problems, and they have a huge deficit, which is really the, the elephant in the room, which mm. we tend to forget, and then every couple of weeks we say, oh yeah, let, let's remember that actually the U.S. is not an easier situation mm. than Europe. Well, no, I would argue that the U.S. is in an easier situation than Europe. Um, the labor market is fine if you've got a job. If you don't have a job, it's awful. But if you've got a job, actually life's good. If you've got a job, your job is relatively safe, your income is going up, not dramatically, but it's going up and you're being offered credit. credit. Consumer credit growing 2 2.5% in the States. Money supply growing 10% in the United States for the broader monetary aggregates. 
technical distortions, yes, but still, you know, these are reasonable numbers. Now, I'm not you know, wildly enthusiastic, I'm not forecasting even above trend growth, but we've got reasonable data coming through there. The banks are prepared to intermediate, they are prepared to lend, that is supporting economic activity. But what about the political gridlock? As far as politics is concerned, this is the, one of the, the, the other key differences between um, uh, the Eurozone and, and the U.S. situation. If nothing happens in America, we get a gradual process of fiscal tightening. If nothing happens in Europe, we get disaster and we start dusting off you know, anything up to and including war scenarios. I mean, you know, if Europe does nothing, it's a nightmare. If America does nothing, we end up with a 2.5% GDP budget deficit in five years' time. So that's a critical difference, I think, between the two, that the default position for the America is one of gradual improvement, not in the Eurozone. Now, Paul, I want to also to get onto the global economy, because you're actually forecasting a moderate expansion with growth of 3.1% next year, 3.4% in 2013. You are warning, though, that the failure to tackle, of course, the debt crisis in Europe could trigger a much greater economic instability and also uncertainty, global recession possibly. How much of a risk is this? We're seeing a lot of the emerging markets now taking steps, mm. almost in preparation of a global recession. Well, I think you know, I mean, we're a long, long way from global recession. I mean, an enormous way from global recession. And frankly, for me, global recession is zero possibility. Um, either we get this sort of anemic growth picture or we get a depression. You know, the idea that somehow the global economy could slow down for a couple of quarters and then it'll be all right no. doesn't work. But what are um, the chances of us getting a depression? Very low, I think, because central banks know what to do. Normally it's policy error. Normally it's policy error on a fairly major scale. And whatever one thinks of the ECB, they're not committing policy error. The Fed is not committing policy error. They're supporting the economy. Liquidity demand goes up. Liquidity supply goes up. That's what's supposed to happen. If we go back to the 30s, in, you know, the decision of the Fed in 32 or the decision of the Bank of Japan in 95 trigger these very prolonged downturns because you get Lehman's moments. You get full-scale credit crunches. We don't see that happening. So I don't think at a global level this is very likely. What we get is more domestic demand, absolutely, from emerging markets. They change the structure of growth. That's the important point. But you don't see that happening because we've been through Lehman's? Yeah. It, it, does it just mean that actually we've learned from Lehman's and so we're in a much better position now to deal with a Lehman-type event because we know how to handle it? I think we've learned from Lehman's. We've learned from 95 in Japan. We've learned from the 1930s, and, you know, the credit and short crisis and the U.S. crisis. You know, we have learned from these mistakes. No one is going to fix us to a gold standard, at least I sincerely I hope, hope. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we've learned from this. Now, could individual countries have depressions? Yes, look at Greece. I mean, Greece is, frankly, in a depression, in my view. Um, but are we going to get that at a global level? I think that is very, very unlikely. All right, thank you so much for joining us. That was a great conversation. Paul Donovan, they're a global economist at UBS Investment Bank.